Sometimes you need the First Amendment to protect the Second Amendment. Sometimes you may need the Second Amendment to protect the First Amendment. That is a big issue in the NRA case versus VLU involving claims by the NRA that the state of New York and its regulators took certain steps in violation of the NRA's First Amendment rights to speak out on political issues, specifically protecting gun rights, the Second Amendment, and so on, and that they were retaliated against. They were attacked by the state of New York through threats by third-party business partners of the NRA. Major Supreme Court case. We've already talked a little bit about this, but now we're going to break it down in a little bit greater detail and cover some additional arguments that were, we heard and dialogue between the Supreme Court justices and the lawyers for both sides of this case. You're not going to want to miss this breakdown in one second. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Boxes Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of many books, including Disarm, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. All right, so we've been covering a little bit the NRA case versus Vulu, um, and of course, many other defendants. As you recall, the NRA uh, sued the state of New York by virtue of alleged conduct by the state of New York and certain regulators that allegedly took steps to punish the NRA and to hurt the NRA financially by virtue of, among other things, having communications, whether it be threats or whatnot, with business partners, insurance partners of the NRA, and this all caused the NRA substantial damages, according to the complaint. The lower courts dismissed the NRA's claim, and now we're, you know, now the NRA is in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and there was argument in this case, and I think the NRA is going to prevail in the Supreme Court and send this case back down uh, for further proceedings and consist consistent with whatever the Supreme Court says. But let's cover some of the very interesting back and forth be between the Supreme Court justices and the lawyers, because sometimes I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. Here are these justices, because these justices are going to be making major decisions about your constitutional rights in the future. To begin with, what's interesting is that the Joe Biden administration, the Solicitor General, on behalf of the federal government, actually stepped in and urged the Supreme Court to rule in favor of the NRA. Now, they want to do it in a very narrow way. Nevertheless, this is exactly what they argued. Here's the Joe Biden Solicitor General's office arguing in favor of the NRA right here and right now. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. Government officials may criticize private speech that they deem harmful and persuade citizens not to support that speech. But government officials may not threaten to take adverse action against private parties to coerce those parties into penalizing a disfavored speaker. Taking petitioners' allegations as true, that is what Respondent did here. In the Lloyds meeting, she explicitly threatened to bring an enforcement action against Lloyds unless Lloyds, quote, ceased providing insurance to gun groups, especially the NRA, close quote. The Court should find a straightforward First Amendment violation under Bantam Books, but in recognizing the First Amendment claim here, the Court should take care to avoid suggesting any new limits on the government's ability to speak to the public or its ability to provide ordinary legal guidance to regulated entities. Then, of course, Justice Clarence Thomas wants to understand in this argument exactly what speech does the NRA claim was being sort of violated or was the critical speech that gave rise to these issues? That was the question asked of the lawyer. Let's see what the answer is to Justice Thomas's questions about what speech is allegedly protected and was violated here. Questions? Uh, Mr. Cole, uh, what uh, is the speech here, protected speech, that uh, you allege has uh, been uh, suppressed? Promoting guns, advocating for gun rights, sending the wrong message. It is, it is that, it was, it was precisely the speech of the NRA which caused Vulo and Cuomo to decide to target their, uh, their partners and seek to coerce them into boycotting the NRA. So they are seeking to penalize the NRA because of its speech advocating for gun rights. So your argument is that the sanctions on a third party uh, suppress the speech of NRA. Yeah, it, it doesn't, it, Your Honor, it doesn't, it, the, the court's First Amendment jurisprudence does not require proof of suppression. It requires proof of burden. If Vulo had imposed a $1 fine on the NRA for promoting guns, it would be unquestionably unconstitutional, even though it wouldn't actually suppress their speech. But here we have actually alleged and this is at the motion to dismiss stage, so the allegations are true, that the NRA has been, has cost, it has cost the NRA 
uh, millions of dollars as a result of the kinds of, um, of, of coercion that has been put in place here, and that the NRA, like any other advocacy group, relies on banks, relies on insurance companies to be able to do their business. And what is their business? Political advocacy. But of course, there's the other side, if you will. Justice Brown Jackson gets into the act in this case, and she starts to try to try to try to draw distinctions between threats and intimidation by government officials versus simply encouragement. So listen to what she's trying to get at here, which is, well, you know, if you threaten someone as a government regulator because of, you don't like their speech, that's one thing. But what if you're simply just out there saying, hey, eat broccoli, it's good for you. Hey, get a shot, it's good for you, right? So she tries to draw this distinction in her back and forth with the lawyer right here. Isn't the issue of coercion different, though, than the First Amendment question? I mean, you are relying on, I think, Bantam Books. Is that correct? Yes. As I read that case, um, there were really two different things going on. There was an unconstitutional prior restraint, and the court recognized that. Um, And there was the implementation of that unconstitutional restraint through the means of government coercion. So if I'm right about that in terms of how we should be thinking about Bantam Books, then don't we have two different questions here? The first being, did Vulo actually coerce uh, any regulated entities to do something vis-a-vis the NRA? And then was that something uh, a violation of the NRA's First Amendment rights, say through uh, retaliation or uh, censorship, which are the two First Amendment theories that I pick up from your complaint? Yeah. Um, uh, Justice Jackson, I think what Bantam Book stands for is that um, government officials uh, are free to encourage people to take, to, to take down speech or to, to penalize a group. What they are not free to do is to use coercion to that end. Here, there's no question on this record that they encouraged people to punish the NRA precisely because and only because of its political views. And that gives rise to discussions involving Justice Samuel Alito, who wants to explain and try to understand how government threats, government coercion falls along a spectrum. You can have some extreme examples on the one hand, but maybe you have more subtle examples. And Justice Alito is trying to understand where in that spectrum is the line drawn between what is legal conduct by the government, such as the government saying, hey, you know, eat less salt. Hey, exercise more. Hey, eat healthy foods versus illegal conduct, which is like, if you don't do what we want you to do because we don't like your message and you, if you don't change your message or do something different because of the political message we don't like, we're going to use government power to punish you. Where is that line? This is what Justice Alito is trying to get at with this back and forth right here. On the question of the meaning of coercion, Um, I can think of a a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, uh, a government official says, look, uh, suppress this speech, and if you don't do it, uh, I have legal weapons I can use against you, and I'm going to punish you using those. That's very clear uh, coercion. Uh, At the other end, the, the government official who has no authority to do anything any practical purposes to the entity that the government official is speaking to says you should do this it it would be a good thing to do you'd be a good citizen if you did it and in between there are a lot of different uh, gradations uh, particularly when the official who's making this request has that power and you have to assume the person or the entity to whom uh, or to which it, the request is being made knows that, just as I, I am sure that these insurance companies were well aware of the power of Ms. Vulo. So how do you define when it goes too far along that line? So I do think that the power of the um, official over those to whom she is speaking is a relevant factor in the assessment. But the assessment is, at the end of the day, would a reasonable person in, these, in this situation um, um, uh, feel that the government is coercing it, that it is uh, implying some sort of threat of action against it, of adverse action against it? So the mere fact that someone exercises regulatory power over you I don't think is sufficient. But when combined with what you have here, explicit requests to 
to punish a group because of its uh, uh, advocacy and the invocation of the very tools she has to make life miserable for them, you're not managing reputational risk. We might fine you or, you know, you, you've got these uh, technical insurance infractions. We might go after your partners uh, and, and require them to never provide you affinity insurance ever again. This is on the, you know, the first end of the spectrum that you identified, Justice Alito. So I, I agree there are hard cases in the middle, and that's true with any standard that at the end of the day looks at coercion. You know, in the, in the, um, uh, the context of uh, uh, confessions, coerced confessions, there are some hard, hard lines to draw. This one is not. Okay. Then what's interesting is Justice Neil Gorsuch actually in a back and forth with an attorney discussing the notion that because of some of the actions of New York State, does the NRA now have sort of a scarlet letter on it this, with respect to financial institutions, banks, and insurance companies? Check out this back and forth with Justice Neil Gorsuch. And we look at the uh, Lloyds incident in isolation or, uh, I mean, you have a complaint uh, we're at the motion to dismiss stage. We have to take inferences in your favor. Yeah. Um, and certainly you don't want to be limited on remand to arguing just the Lloyds incident as your, your case. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, you know, the, I think right now the most uh, significant harm to the NRA is that the uh, DFS continues to maintain on its website these guidance letters, which essentially put a scarlet letter on the NRA with respect to every bank and every insurance company in New York. Those should be taken down. So we would urge you, both for purposes of um, guidance to, to others uh, and uh, because it matters to, to, the, to the ultimate uh, remedy in this case, to address the, 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 uh, the, the meeting with Lloyds, the uh, guidance letters, uh, and the subsequent enforcement action. And the other thing I would say about the meeting with Lloyds is it was in private. It was in private. So that it, we, we, the NRA might uh, have, have suffered some damages vis-a-vis -vis Lloyd's with respect to that meeting. But the real damage in terms of the, um, uh, you know, putting the scarlet letter on the NRA comes from her public actions and Governor Cuomo's public actions to issue these guidance letters. So I would urge you to address the whole picture here uh, to, to reinforce Bandom Books. Uh, and to uh, reverse on the, on the merits. Thank you. Now, this next question involves Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Now, this is a very important question. I'm not sure a lot of people picked up on this, but Justice Kavanaugh is trying to ask questions about the gun industry, gun manufacturers, and trying to understand whether or not there might be some sort of a distinction under the First Amendment's right to free speech between how government actors, government regulators can treat, let's say, a gun or Second Amendment advocacy group like the NRA versus how they might treat commercial actors like gun manufacturers and gun companies. This is what Justice Kavanaugh has to say. And again, one quick thought. Speech can consist of actions. When we usually think of speech, we think of like Mark talking out loud, but sometimes actions can be speech. Um, you know, giving someone the finger would be an example of an action that could convey speech. Giving someone the thumbs up might be another example of an action giving rise to free speech or nodding one's head or all sorts of other actions like artists engage in actions. A dancer may be engaging in First Amendment protected speech by dancing, if you see what I'm saying. So with that in mind, keep in mind that sometimes conduct can constitute speech under the First Amendment. So with that in mind, let's turn to Justice Brett Kavanaugh. And what if uh, New York went to insurance companies and said, we don't want you to uh, continue insuring gun manufacturers or sellers um, for the same reasons? Um, how does that constitutional analysis work? Well, that wouldn't be a First Amendment problem because what, I don't think well, it's would a First Amendment. Would it, it might, be anything? It might, it might be a Second Amendment problem. I don't know, but I, I, I'm not sure it would. I mean, it's, if it's focused, if the government's coercion is focused on conduct rather than speech, then it's not a First Amendment. And that's uh, then my last question on Bantam Books. This is a little bit unusual, obviously, because it's not going to, the government's not going to a communications company, a bookstore, a social media company to say, take down that speech, but is going to an insurance company. But I guess I take your point that Bantam Books, as long as the ultimate action is against uh, speech, it doesn't matter that the intermediary is not 
uh, itself a speech business. Yeah, I think the key is it's this use of uh, the third party to punish the target. So, for example, in Bantam Books, if they had said, we're going to encourage insur- those, pro- those providers of insurance, the bookstores, yeah. to stop providing insurance, that wouldn't be a speech intermediary, but it would be the same problem. Thank you. Now, Justice Thomas talks about something quite interesting here, and this is another important distinction that to be the smartest person in the room, you need to understand how this works together. Justice Thomas wants to really talk about the carrot and the stick approach when it comes to government action overseeing uh, behavior and whether or not it violates the First Amendment's right to free speech. He tries to talk about essentially enticements versus intimidation. So for example, if I say, if you don't do what I want, I'm going to break your window, or I'm going to do something bad to you, or I'm going to sue you, or I'm going to cancel your business license. That's an example of coercive intimidation, threatening speech or conduct perhaps. But then there's also the notion of enticements. Like maybe I could say, well, geez, you know, I'm not going to do anything good or bad for you about this, but if you do what I want you to do and basically don't help out people I don't like, maybe there's an enticement, a carrot at the end of the line for you. Maybe there's some benefit to you. And here's Justice Thomas trying to understand in the context of the First Amendment, how does the notion of threats and coercion on the one hand play out against, let's say, carrots or enticements? Let's turn to Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court Justice, right now. Uh, could the government, uh, rather than uh, coerce uh, uh, a third party, simply uh, entice uh, them to reach the same suppression, do the, the exact same thing, and suppress speech? Well, it depends, Justice Thomas, what you mean by entice. If it doesn't rise to the level of significant encouragement under... But what's Bloom. the difference? Well, Bloom requires that significant encouragement essentially overwhelm the the judgment of the independent, the intermediary, whereas... And what would that look like uh, in this case? In in this case, I mean, I think you could kind of, I think you could think of the offer of leniency that Vulo made to Lloyds as either a form of significant encouragement because she's saying we will go easy on you for some legal violations or as a threat basically saying we will bring these enforcement actions against you if you do not stop doing business with gun groups. So coercion and significant encouragement are two sides of the same coin, as Mr. Fletcher said earlier. Now, this next discussion involving the attorneys and Justice Sam Alito is quite interesting because here he's trying to understand why is it that, for example, certain communication from the government may take on the form of like something formal, like a formal guidance letter or a formal regulation or some sort of formal statement issued to, let's say, an industry that they regulate versus, in contrast, like a letter to the to the editor, an op-ed. So, you know, it's one thing for Joe Biden to act as the president and do something using government power over you. It may be another thing if Joe Biden uses the bully pulpit. He writes a letter to the editor. He gives a speech about, hey, this is, would be good to do. Again, government action versus encouragement, uh, speech, things like this. This is what Justice Alito is trying to get at with the questions right here. So, And does that mean that really uh, the New York officials could have achieved what they wanted to achieve if they hadn't done it in such a ham-handed manner? So instead of having the meeting with Lloyd's uh, and uh, th- they just uh, gave speeches about uh, uh, the terror about guns and how bad the NRA is, and they spoke about uh, social backlash against guns and those who advocate for gun rights in the wake of the terrible Parkland shooting. But in all of that, they don't mention anything about any regulatory authority. And then, after harping on that. Uh, for a while, then they make general statements about the importance of every insurance company taking into account uh, reputational risk. And then they sit back and they see whether that's achieved the, the desired result. Basically, that's what your position is, isn't it? No, Your Honor. Well, we're, we're uh, primarily... Well, would, if, I, if what they did was what I just outlined, would that be a, a violation of Bantam Books? Probably not, because there would be an attenuation between the invocation of legal consequences and the instruction or the message. We think the first four paragraphs of the guidance letters standing alone are permissible government speech, because those four paragraphs involve criticisms of the NRA and urging third 
parties not to support the NRA. That's the classic form of government speech that falls within longstanding tradition. President Reagan expressly criticized the KKK and urged citizens not to support or associate with the KKK. That's what the first four paragraphs are doing. Well, and if they had said everything in those first four paragraphs in some other format, it would be a different matter. But this is a guidance letter. I take the point that— They understand what a guidance letter is about, right? Now, of course, Justice Alito is known for his humor, and here's a funny example. Keep in mind that Justice Alito is from New Jersey. He originally was on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit in the state of New Jersey, and he is known for barbs going toward New York or making fun of New Yorkers or making fun of people in New York City. Here's a classic example right here, right now, where he refers to New Yorkers as rubes. Check this out. The point they understand what a guidance letter is about, right? I take the point that the fact that it's in a guidance letter is highly unusual. You would expect to see this in an op-ed or a a press conference. And that is a factor, I think, in going to the implicit coercive analysis. But without the fifth paragraph, there's no invocation of an adverse action at all. So the first four paragraphs standing alone, although unusual, would still be permissible government speech. Yeah, so they they gilded the lily or whatever the phrase is. I mean, they were ham-handed about this. The people up in New York are rubes. They don't really understand how to do this. If you do it in a more sophisticated manner, you can achieve what you want to achieve. Uh, I I, I don't know, Justice Alito, because I don't know that insurance companies and banks would feel that their will was overborne or that they were really at risk of experiencing adverse action in your hypothetical. That's the question. Are Are the parties able to exercise their own independent judgment? Pretty funny comment there by uh, Justice Alito. Certainly drew laughter in the courtroom. But the reality is he's trying to get at something much more serious. He's trying to understand, you know, how is it that, you know, one of the things I think Justice Alito is concerned about is subtlety and nuance. Because while some people may not be smart enough to understand nuance or subtlety or deep, you know, kind of abstract thought, his point, I think, is that when you're dealing with sophisticated finance guys, if you're dealing with insurance companies, you're dealing with banks, you're dealing with hedge funds and private equity, I think what he's basically saying is that a regulator in the finance space is sophisticated enough and the business people in the finance space on Wall Street are sophisticated enough to understand winks and nods and subtle hints. And I think what he's trying to get at here is, you know, if a regulator says something like, hey, you know, it'd be nice if you stop doing that, that is enough of a hint to sophisticated Wall Street banker types and insurance companies that they're going to understand that they better toe the line or something bad may happen to them from the government. Now, again, that seems to be where Justice Alito is concerned with these kinds of subtle notions or nudges by government regulators getting the businesses on Wall Street, the insurance companies and the banks and financial institutions to do the government's bidding or to behave the way the government wants through implied threats or implied inducements that if you behave, good things will happen to you and we will make that occur. Let's watch this back and forth with Justice Alito now. I mean, seriously, you think that sophisticated in, in, uh, insurance companies are not taking into account adverse risks? They probably had heard about the Parkland shooting and the aftermath of it. Uh, you think they hadn't already taken this into account? And didn't they already know uh, all the power that Ms. Volo had over them? They certainly knew about the authority that DFS had, but without any invocation of that authority and a tying of that authority to a specific instruction like we have in the guidance letters, I don't think we would get to coercion. I also Now, what's interesting is Justice Sonia Sotomayor actually sat before the United States Supreme Court. She was on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. That was in New York City. So Justice Sotomayor, when she was Judge Sotomayor, was quite familiar with sort of the finance issues associated with New York City and New York law because she got a lot of those cases on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which gets lots and lots and lots of big business cases, uh, which you get a lot of in New York City. I can promise you that, having lived that life for a very long time. So it's very interesting that Judge Sotomayor here is kind of expressing skepticism at New York's conduct. And again, one would think that uh, Justice Sotomayor may not be a fan of the NRA and their policies. Nevertheless, she is expressing skepticism of some of the conduct that is alleged to have occurred by the state of New York. Let's listen carefully to what Justice Sotomayor Sotomayor has to say here. Sorry, these affinity programs could have been altered. And these consent decrees and what she was seeking 
was a ban even of potentially lawful affinity programs. I mean, if they had taken out the intentionality provision or the criminal activity provision and just insured for accidents with guns or things like that, those would have been lawful. So she went further and said, you can't even have... And DFS and regulators do that all the time, Justice Sotomayor. So there are two buckets of illegal activity, serious illegal activity, that Ms. Vulo isolated and the issue in the, cons- in the consent orders by name. One is the provision of intentional act insurance, sometimes called murder insurance. That violates public policy in New York as almost every state. Second, the fact NRA was doing all of these affinity products without a license. Now, just without a license alone... DFS routinely imposes massive sanctions, including lifetime bans. For example, MetLife, which we cite in our brief, in 2014, they were offer- did the same thing, offering unlicensed insurance with a partner, lifetime ban. Lifetime bans are not unusual. They happen all the time in securities regulation. You can have a lifetime ban for a meeting. What normally happens, just to my own in these cases, is if the NRA ever decided that they wanted to get a license and offer a lawful plan, they then come back and seek a modification of the consent order. But there's nothing unusual whatsoever about a punishment like this. What is unusual is to allow a strike suit like this. Remember, this case was filed during the investigation in May of 2018 in order to stop it from going forward. The consent order then happened, and, uh, and so now they're here trying to effectively undo that enforcement action. And the worry here, it's not just about this case. It's about any case, because everyone can allege, you know, can stop a plea negotiation or a consent set of negotiations by saying, you're retaliating against me. I mean, you know, if you just think about um, what Dinesh D'Souza said publicly in, in his filings or Michael Avenatti about the president, I'm being retaliated against because of me, because of my speech. And that's the danger, and that's why there's there's always been an objective unreasonability standard. And Mr. Cole says in his brief at page 23, in his reply brief, oh, don't worry, the NRA will never do this. We've only filed one suit on Bantam Books before in our history, and it's this one. That's wrong. In five minutes of internet research, we found another case in which the NRA sued San Francisco on exactly that theory. And if you look at his amici briefs, at least 10 of them admit they want to do this to open up lawsuits for when Chick-fil-A isn't being zoned in the right place. To wrap up, this is a very interesting back and forth between Justice Alito and the lawyers for New York. What's interesting is, if you know, if, if you recall, one of the reasons in 2005... Congress enacted uh, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, right? They did that to protect the gun industry from undue burdensome discovery of these kind of strike suits by anti-gun organizations and people supporting lawsuits against the gun industry, and that was being abused. And there was an attempt to put the industry out of business by these kind of abusive suits that were never going to win at the end of the day, but the cost of defending them were extremely high. What's very interesting is when you listen to New York's answer to these questions from Justice Alito, keep that in mind as you hear the New York lawyer saying that really it's not appropriate to get in discovery because it's too burdensome, costly, and sensitive. Ironic and hypocritical, but listen carefully to what the state of New York has to say, because you won't hear this anywhere else. Check it out. Uh, you're you're shifting the burden to them. This is a First Amendment case. They All they need to do is to show that the desire to suppress speech was a motivating factor. They don't have to prove that the, the uh, regulatory action would have been taken, even if Ms. Volo didn't have this motivation. So, so I think, Your Honor, that Nieves directly says no to that. What Nieves says is be precisely because allegations against enforcement are so easy to allege and difficult to disprove, and because it bumps up against the presumption of regularity, and because it opens the door to massive discovery and to sensitive government files, and because it incentivizes people to make controversial speech and then claim an exemption, no, you incentivize this be in the pleading itself. And that's, you know, that's consistent, of course, with, like, for example, Iqbal and Twombly, which said similar things even outside of the retaliation. I, I'm really, this is kind of, uh, suppose the allegation was uh, we had a meeting with Ms. Volo and she pulled out a, a, a pistol and she held it to our heads 
and she said, I'm going to blow your brains out unless you stop uh, writing insurance for the NRA, that would not be enough to uh, even allege a Bantam Books violation because uh, she might have taken that same regulatory action. She might have taken regulatory action for a perfectly legitimate reason. Your Honor, there the government's conduct would be objectively unreasonable and it would flunk our test. So we think this is not a hard test. We're not seeking to change the law. We're just pointing out that when you're in a situation like this of conceded illegality, that there is an obvious alternative explanation for what Ms. Vula was doing here, which was enforcing the law. And this is the worst case in order for you to say this should go past 12b-6, because if you allow this case with its conceded illegality to go past, back, go past 12b-6, uh, then I think any plaintiff will be able to do this. All right, folks. Well, there you have it. Kind of a bigger summary today of the NRA versus Vulu case. Very interesting case. I think the NRA is definitely going to win at the Supreme Court. That's my prediction. We'll see what happens. And then they'll it'll go back down for further proceedings. Anyway, we uh, will let you know as we hear more information about this. I suspect there will be a decision in this case sometime in late June of this year. In the meantime, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Resubscribe. Uh, help us get to 150,000 subscribers. We're trying hard to grow our subscriber base. Make sure you follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner, and we will see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.